Welcome to SVG TV's news for Wednesday, August 4th, 2021. I'm Triska Campbell with the details. The Public Health Amendment Bill will be tabled in Parliament tomorrow and Prime Minister Dr. Alf Gonsalves has reiterated that his government uh, has no intention uh, to make the vaccination mandatory but that it will be made a requirement for frontline workers to get vaccinated. He said frontline workers who refuse to be vaccinated can either be transferred or get another job that is not on the front line. To be vaccinated well, the point is this: if if the if you can be placed elsewhere, if a reasonable accommodation can be made for you to be placed elsewhere, so be it. But if not, well, you have a choice of not working as a nurse; you get a job at something else. Because we are in a pandemic, the overall health of the country, the public health of the country, is vital, and of course, the economy. You can't have it, 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 the people who are at the airport, the people who, who you're meeting with, the immigration officers, the, the workers at the Argyle International Airport, the, the customs officers at the, at the ports of entry. The Prime Minister noted that the world is still facing a pandemic and while SVG did not go into a state of emergency, the country is still battling a public health emergency, hence the need for frontline workers to be vaccinated. In the area of the frontline worker, health workers, doctors and nurses, Johnny P. A fisherman may decide that he ain't taking the vaccine. A farmer may decide that he ain't taking the vaccine. A casual worker may say that, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting a yard, I'm doing this, I'm, I'm taking the vaccine. Though they should. But even those workers themselves, if they go into the hospital, they go into a clinic, would want to know that who is giving them injection, who is coming to them at... at um, a accident and emergency who is coming on the wards to deal with them the government has already made it clear that public health uh, that the public health amendment bill 2021 does not involve any legal penalty or punishment on anyone who fails uh, and or refuses to take the vaccine or test for COVID-19. The Prime Minister said persons can get exemptions once they can produce a medical certificate from a doctor who, have a, who has a genuine reason why they cannot take the vaccine. But you're not going to allow just for any doctor. The, law, the, the regulation is going to say, and the law in fact is going to say, the actual law one of the amendments tomorrow is going to say that um, the chief medical officer would name the doctors who are going to issue such certificates. And of course, as an operational issue, the chief medical officer tells me is that when that certificate is issued, even by persons who are named to issue those certificates, the reasoning would be assessed by a group of doctors, the medical board, so to speak. Because, you know, you have some doctors who are anti-vaxxers or who, for whatever reason, trying to trust Pana in the works. The Public Service Union, the Teachers Union and the Police Welfare Association have all opposed the amendments made to the Public Health Amendment Bill, which will be debated in Parliament tomorrow. The unions held a joint news conference yesterday where they stated their concerns with the bill which they say imposes vaccination on workers in the public sector, particularly frontline workers. President of the Public Service Union, Elroy Boucher, said that the amendments seek to strip the sanctions of their rights. Those amendments, as a union, we are extremely concerned with those stated amendments to the Public Health Act, as the government has put forward. These amendments, in our view, infringe on the right to conscience, beliefs, and thoughts, a right which guarantees our freedom to choose what goes into our bodies and that of our families. Boucher said the government showed disregard to public sector workers and their unions with a no consultation on the proposed changes to be made to the Public Health Act. That there would be some consultation with the different organizations tasked with representing public officers and even workers in the private sector. But instead of dialogue, and its extensive and extensive consultation 
what we got is an authoritarian approach with no regards for constitutional freedom of Vincent Jans. Nearby, in our sister island of Barbados, we see a complete contrast to this approach. Prime Minister Mia Motley is also considering mandatory vaccination, but her approach is what we can call people-centered. President of the SVG Welfare Association, Brenton Smith, said that police are at a cr are the crossroads with the proposed changes and urged all police officers to take a stand. Colleague, whereas today the issue of consideration is COVID-19, we don't know what tomorrow, next week, next month, or even next year will. The law, as it is crafted, now is not speaking singly to COVID-19, but rather to contagious diseases. As former Commissioner of Police, as Bon Crow would often say, do what is right and fear no man. Fellow officers, I urge you to follow your conscience and continue to seek professional medical advice from your doctor. President of the SVG Teachers Union, Oswald Robinson, said he has been closely monitoring the changes taking place and asked that teachers join forces to kill the bill. Constitution of St. Vincent and Grenadines, that the government intends to hinder our enjoyment of our freedom of conscience. And this is trampling upon a fundamental right. I also want to link this as a racial issue also. Because the majority of people in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, you're either Kalinavu, you're Garifuna, and to some extent, from those who came here as indentured servants. And so, when we look at various pieces of instruments that the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines would have ratified. Lawyers representing the three unions, Israel Bruce, Zita Barnwell, and Jomo Thomas, all weighed in on the proposed changes to the Public Health Act, with Parliament, which Parliament will debate and ask to approve or pass tomorrow. Part. This is why I read this part. They will be exempted on two grounds. First, on the ground that the vaccination is not advisable on medical grounds. The first ground is that it is not advisable on medical grounds. But who makes that final determination if it is advisable? Not your medical doctor. The ultimate final position on whether or not it is advisable falls in the lap of the chief medical officer. Even if, that, even if the, the government is removing the word voluntary and saying it's not mandatory, the way you're boxed in is oppressive and is forcing you to take the, in, the investigational vaccine. So you have to pay for your own test. Think about it. If, uh, if uh, depending on what your paycheck is, and you choose to exercise that right, the burden falls on you to be able to, whether it's, it's every two weeks, I can't recall, every two weeks, to pay for this test. That whatever the government is doing, in whatever way, violates the rights of any citizen, then that citizen can file a motion in the court that seeks to that seeks redress from the court to the perceived or actual violation. So the answer is yes, you do have redress. And one new COVID-19 positive case was reported from 214 samples processed on Tuesday, August 3rd, 2021, resulting in a positivity rate of 0.4%. No new recoveries were noted over the reporting period. 
Of 53 cases are currently active and 12 persons with COVID-19 have died. 2,298 cases of COVID-19 and 2,233 recoveries have been recorded in St. Vincent and the Grenadines since March 2020. The health authorities say persons who persist in incorrect or no mask use remain unvaccinated and participate in mass gatherings will continue to be at a risk for being infected and spreading COVID-19. And that to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in SVG, uh, the compliance with the protocols, including the effective use of masks, physically distancing, and the evidence-based recommendations to be vaccinated with the available vaccines is strongly recommended. The Central Water and Sewage Authority, the CWSA, has now reached as far as Oya in the restoration of the water to communities in North Winwood in the red zone, which were affected by the explosive eruption of La Cifrea volcano. Giving up an update on the National Registra Restoration Exercise, a Prime Minister, Dr. Alf Gonsalves, said that the CWSA and Finlec have been doing a great job. As it regards to water restoration, the Prime Minister Gonzalez said CWSA will eventually reach the last community, Fancy, very soon. We are back. Water is in Sandy Bay. They're working in Oya at the moment. I'm talking about the, the, the catchment. We, some areas which are served by Sandy Bay. Like, for instance, um, to overland, the pipes were disrupted and they, they, they haven't replaced those yet. They're in the process of doing that. I've been advised by the Central Water and Sewers Authority. And then when they finish over here, they will go up to Fancy. Vinlec has also carried out major restoration works in the red and orange zones with poles and lines being replaced. Prime Minister Gonzalez said to date over 800 homes in the red zone have been reconnected with electricity. About, I've been told about eight, 900 homes in the, in the north east have been reconnected with, with, with homes and they probably have another 400, 500 or thereabouts to connect with electricity. So progress steadily is being made. We have to do things which are, which, are, which are proper, careful. We have to make sure that people's safety is, is seriously extolled. You know, we have to, that's a, that's a, a primary obligation. With basic services restored in most of the communities on the red zone, the Prime Minister said that the cleaning up of the ash is the only holdback for giving the all clear for residents to fully reoccupy the communities. The, the, the main areas for the ash and so on have been, they've been dealt with. Um, but people, when they come back and clean the ash, come back to the road, they have to do it again. It's an ongoing activity. And then, of course, they have to be washing down the place. Unfortunately, one of the trucks um, got into an accident and, you know, it's, it's not operational. So that limits some of the cleaning, I mean, or washing down. Um, they're making other arrangements. Then the work will, will, will go up. You don't have as much ash actually and, and debris in Oya and Sandy Bay. Sorry, and Oya and Fancy as you have in Sandy Bay. Sandy Bay is the, is the main area actually from London right through the, the, the Sandy Bay proper. We have working up there 60 odd trucks, big trucks, and uh, about 15 or so pieces of heavy duty equipment. That's what I've been advised. The All Clear has already been given for persons uh, of communities in the red zone south of Arabica to return to their homes. As VGTV News understands that a number of persons from communities above Arabica have already returned to their homes fully, while others await official All Clear.
four of the schools being used as shelters to host persons who are displaced by the volcanic eruption will be vacated by next week and renovation works on the buildings will commence thereafter. This is according to Prime Minister Dr. Alcansas on radio today. 40 odd shelters we are going to have. We have among those 28 schools. So within the next week or so, we are going to move persons from four of the schools, including schools with big um, student populations like prep school um, and uh, CW Prescott, because we have to do repairs and renovations. Today, 1,551 persons still remain in shelters. As the COVID-19 pandemic halted the movement of persons from the major tourism source markets across the world, Minister of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Sustainable Development and Culture, Carlos James, has made the call for more hotels and businesses in the tourism sector to begin catering to, domestic, to the domestic market. Addressing day one of the Virtual Tourism Stakeholders Conference, Minister James said in order for the tourism sector to be viable and sustainable, SVG and other countries in the region cannot depend solely on the international market, as any ripple effects in the global economy can uh, cause a significant reduction in the movement of people, pointing uh, terrorism, natural disasters, and most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. The primary things is that we have to look at our local market. I challenge you, because not enough hotels design rates that are affordable and reasonable and welcoming to locals. We have to move in that model. Some do it, but not all. Our marketing focuses on our source markets, and this is something I, I think across the whole region. But yet, within our region, all of us, we tend to forget the millions of people that are available around us, within our destination, and our neighboring countries intra-regionally and extra-regionally, South America, Northern Caribbean. We have to move towards promoting and advancing the cause for greater movement of people within the region. The tourism minister further lamented on the lack of provisions which encourage interregional travel due to high airfares, noting that St. Vincent's and the Grenadines was one of the first destinations in the region to reduce the departure tax by 50% to facilitate and encourage domestic travel. CARICOM heads coming together to discuss the reduction of rates for duty on travel. We took that initiative since last year in this country. We moved our rates in terms of uh, the batch of tax, I think down to somewhat 50 percent. We took the lead on that since last year. It's nothing novel, it's nothing new. Because we understand that there must be movement of people. And if international travelers are constrained, we have to look at the markets regionally, which we can promote the free movement of people. Former CEO and Secretary General of the Caribbean Tourism Organization and former visionary Minister of Tourism of the Bahamas, Vincent Vanderpool Wallace, is the regional keynote speaker at the conference. He lauded the initiative by St. Vincent's and the Grenadines to adjust its taxes and noted that too many people travel out of the region because it is too expensive to travel to neighboring islands. The business of reducing the fixed taxes on airline tickets. Now, you know, this is something that we've been talking about for 20 years. St. Vincent ran out there and did it because it makes a substantial difference. There are too many people in the Caribbean who are flying to Florida because it's cheaper to go to Florida than it is to go to the place next door. It's nonsense. We're in the business of selling Florida because of our insanity. 
So the initiative that St. Vincent started, we hope it becomes a real virus to go around the region because the largest untapped market for the Caribbean is the Caribbean itself. And that is something that we have never ever gotten to understand, but I see the beginning of that happening with an initiative that really was started here. So really congratulations to, to um, St. Vincent and, and, and the Grenadines. Meanwhile, the regional tourism experts said tourism is a holistic business that must involve every citizen in the land. Vanderpool Wallace in his address noted the importance of getting every citizen to grasp the concept of tourism being everyone's business. Really only, and the PS referred to this earlier, is the only economic sector on earth where every single citizen is involved. It's the only one. The customers and people who come and visitors and guests and local guests who come and enjoy whatever we have in St. Vincent, they don't care if they're maltreated by somebody who is not working in tourism. They go back home and talk about that negative experience. So it doesn't matter. And so if you don't understand that fundamentally, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're fixing lots of things and trying to figure out why isn't it working. It is the entire community that it's, it's all about. There is no such thing as private sector tourism or public sector tourism. There's only one tourism. And it has to be a combination everywhere and always about what's the right thing to do. There's no such thing as community tourism. None. Why? All tourism is community tourism. And if you've got to go define community tourism, that means you're not doing the totality of what tourism is all about. Because it has to be tourism is of the people, by the people, and for the people. The former CEO and Secretary General of the Caribbean Tourism Organization encouraged the sharing of information, often with the public, in order to create an inclusive approach to developing the tourism sector, noting the strategy that was employed in the Bahamas for creating an environment where all persons saw themselves as part of the tourism product. If you say that everybody in the country is involved in tourism, then the tourism plan's got to be shared with everybody regularly to let them know what's going on and how they can help to make it better. If you're not doing that, then you're saying one thing and doing something else. They need to understand out there, here is what is all involved. We got to the stage where every year, on a national television program, there we were sharing what the tourism plan was with everybody. Here's what it is and here's how you can help in terms of what it is. And I'm not guessing it made a world of difference. Make it very clear. It wasn't me that caused this particular thing out there to happen. It's us. And then you've got to get one another policing other people when they see people doing things that make no sense and damaging the brand. When you begin to get an entire population moving in a direction of providing high quality services to anybody who comes into the country, nobody can copy that tomorrow. So what should you be doing? You should be doing something that enables the entire population in your island to make sure that they are as welcoming and as embracing because it cannot be easily copied. It takes time to get done, but it ain't something that can be easily copied. Two Vincentian women and a Nigerian man have been taken into custody in Grenada for not entering the island at a recognized port of entry and having improper documentation from the relevant immigration authorities. As we hear in this GBN television news report, the Nigerian is said to be linked to drug and money laundering. Superintendent Vani Cohen, head of the Community Relations Department, indicated that these individuals would be charged and taken to court. We have had a number of illegal immigrants again entering Grenada without permission from our immigration officers or, or without coming through you know, a recognized port of entry. We have had two Vincentian females who are currently in custody, and we have had a Nigerian who is linked to drug-related drug charges and money laundering. D these individuals have been processed as we speak, and by the end of the day, charges are definitely going to be laid, and they will perhaps be taken to court tomorrow or perhaps the day after. Superintendent Cohen encouraged citizens to be more vigilant and to adhere to the COVID-19 protocols. In 2021, over 18 persons have been arrested and charged for illegally entering the country. Most recently, 
Three female Vincentians, Cassani Bob, Love Collis, and Amina were deported back to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Over 50 persons representing community disaster response team, a CDRT groups, and other volunteers of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Red Cross Society, SVGRCS, are now better equipped with the tools and knowledge on how to be the initial responders in their communities in the event of a disaster or hazard. This through the annual multi-hazard residence workshop hosted by the Red Cross last Thursday, July 29th at the NIS conference room. The workshop was a part of the National Society's continued response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the outbreak of dengue fever, the aftermath of the April 9th volcanic eruption, and now the hurricane season, which has been predicted by experts to be an active one. The multi-hazard residence workshop was considered to be one of the was was considered to be one that was well overdue and aimed to pro, to provide the participants with a platform for dialogue. It placed emphasis on the roles and responsibilities of the Red Cross as an organization, along with the along with that of the volunteers and disaster response teams, as outlined in the National Disaster Plan. The organizer says the participants were able to build a common understanding of the impact based forecasting and warning services in SVG, as well as identifying the approaches and priorities for the 2021 hurricane season and provided recommendations for their community response. The workshop also saw the execution of a simulation exercise which, uh, fo which focused on the approach of a Category 3 hurricane. The participants were split in two groups. One group was tasked to take the necessary steps to get the community prepared up to the point of landfall. The other group was challenged to act upon the necessary steps to take in response to the declaration of an all-clear by the police, by the public authorities. President of the SVG Red Cross Society, Bernard Morgan, said the participants were brilliant, noting that the teams portrayed leadership, coordination, and communication, and, emphasi and emphasized on an effective early warning strategy. The workshop also provided the platform for the review of the National Society's response to the volcanic eruption, as well as other hazards such as landslide, flooding, and hurricanes.